The competition is getting fierce at the UA Sports Festival, these intramurals that I'm watching, and that really makes for a fun arc. So which part captured my imagination the most? Let's find out. So going down the stretch in this obstacle course race competition, it really looks like a two-person contest. We got Bakugo, we got Todoroki, clearly the two outstanding members of the class. Of course, Bakugo got great natural talent with his quirk and that explosion hand quirk of his. But then Todoroki has pretty darn good quirk, and we even find out there's a whole aspect to his quirk he prefers not to use. You know, we do see that he has this flame ability, and he uses it by accident, and it's on the side of his body with the red hair, and he says, I never use that side of my body. So a lot of fun there, but he's got like the experience and the wisdom. Bakugo's got the raw power. Looks like a two-horse competition, if you'll allow me to use a horse racing metaphor. But then, you know, close to the finish line, just when the race is about to wrap up in kind of tropey storytelling fashion, well, Deku uses a little gamesmanship and technique to quite literally leapfrog the people at the head of the, the, head of the race here. And it's kind of interesting because it's not quite a tortoise in the hare phenomenon, but it's like let these two guys compete against each other, beat each other up, wear each other down, and you kind of slip in and steal the victory. At least that's how I interpreted it when I was watching the race. But I was also kind of worried that every single contest was going to go this way and Deku was just going to like tiptoe through the competition, sweep everything, and have just a little bit of a Mary Sue type moment. Like if he just wins too much, well that takes some of the fun and the consequences and the challenge away and that's more like a younger person's story than an all ages or even adult story would be. So I was a little bit worried at how he kind of stole that victory and I thought, oh my goodness, is this, is this going to happen on repeat again and again as if it were written by a fifth grade? Well, thank goodness it doesn't, but that was a concern I was having for a moment, which is kind of cool that the show lets you have that worry so they can show you they're not going to do it. I think that's great. But of course, predictably, Deku's victory, well, it just raises or rises Bakugo's ire. And I think Bakugo really needs to work on himself because I think Bakugo is capable of being a great hero and helping a lot of people, saving a lot of lives, stopping a lot of villains but he really has to work on himself first. He's got the raw materials he needs, but his emotional status, his mental status, I think that is what he needs to hone and work on while these other characters are working on their quirks and their physical skills and their strategy. He really needs to look inside, in my opinion. And one thing I'm kind of curious about as we do get to understand Bakugo a little bit more is what is the the seed, the genesis of this glitch in his personality. And something else I'm really curious about is to see if he does actually have self-doubt. And the reason I say that is because fragility, like a fragile ego or a fragile self-image and overconfidence can look a lot alike from the outside. And there's a part of me that's starting to wonder if maybe there's a little bit of self-doubt that he's trying to overcompensate for with this abrasive personality and this cocky arrogance that he brings up to the podium when he goes to open the contest. I don't know if that's what we're gonna explore, but at least it's a possibility that keeps me interested in this character. Like he's far from being written off at this point, in my book at least. And after the race, we move into the next competition, which is called the Calv Cavalry Battle. And of course, cavalry are mounted soldiers. You know, they go back to as long as people have been riding horses, militaries have had cavalry units. I think I even said this before, that even back before people were riding horses, they used horses to pull chariots into battle. So cavalry's been around pretty much as long as warfare has been around. But they have this game where some of the students are the horses, some of the students are the riders, and they've got to compete to get each other's bandana for points. And there's a graduated point system that sort of makes sense. You know, the lower you scored in the previous competition, the fewer points you're worth in this competition. And it does sort of make sense, but it also has a bit of a flaw in my opinion that we'll get to a little bit later. Also, uh, your point value in this competition being affected by your outcome in the obstacle course, I mean, it does make for some interesting gamesmanship if you're purely looking at this as a game. But if you're looking at this as a tool to evaluate people's performance and their potential as heroes, I don't know that those skills overlap so much. Like outperforming someone in cavalry battle that you lost to in the obstacle course doesn't mean you're better than that person. It just means you're better at cavalry battle and they're better at, better at obstacle course. So I don't know how much I like this graduated point system, 
But from a gamesmanship point of view, which I guess this is a festival and not really a job application or an audition, it's an informal audition. So it doesn't have to be purely fair. And there's also a nice little scene where we get some insight from the professors at UA and we get to see them like discussing the festival and discussing the students. And as someone who's worked in education before, this is kind of a familiar moment where you're talking about the students you guys have in common, your assessments, their strengths and weaknesses. What have you seen from them that maybe I haven't? How can we work together to help this person? What do we need to do to better serve this person? Kind of a nice peek behind the curtain here in their educational system. I also like how involved the professors are getting in the festival from a fan point of view. I mean, I'm assuming that they've all been in this situation before, so it's familiar territory, kind of living out their glory days maybe vicariously through some of their favorite students. But it's when we get to the top of the line for the point values that I really start to have a problem, and that's because it's just not scaled appropriately. In fact, it turns the competition into a really one-dimensional thing because Deku, who won the previous race, well, he's worth 10 million points, which it makes sense that the person who finished first would be worth the most points, but the person who finished 42nd, I think they're worth either five or 10 points, and that elevation is just a little too abrupt. Not only that, but the gap between the first place finisher and the second place, I think the second place was like a thousand points or less and first place is 10 million. Well, that means the only way to win this competition is to have that one person's point value. You could capture the other 41 point values, they still wouldn't add up to as much as Deku's and I think that's just a flaw in the design. You know, I understand the writer really wanted to show that there was this massive target on Deku's back when this happened, but I think you could have done that with just 10,000 points, you know, and still added a little bit more suspense to it. Like in the real world, I don't think a game show or a competition would ever be constructed with that much of a gap in the top point value because that's really then what the competition's all about. But something I didn't understand, if you hold on to your own bandana, do you get that point value? Or do those points just go to zero? Because then it makes it a lively game. Because then if Deku holds on to his own, but it's only worth zero, they don't win. But if he gets that credit for it, then they do. And I didn't understand how that rule worked. Maybe I just didn't pay close enough attention. I'll revisit it and see. We get to learn a little bit about Fumikagi. I'm pretty sure I'm saying that name right now. And his dark shadow quirk. We get to see how that works in a little bit there this episode. It's an interesting looking character and power that I've seen before, of course. But we never really got to see the details of what that power is. Also, before this episode, I don't think I really appreciated that the dark shadow always stays connected to the torso of Fumikagi. And we learned a little bit about Dark Shadow really does better at night than during the day, so there's less power, so he has to use it wisely here. Pretty interesting, a lot of fun, and you get to see some strategy as one of the episodes is just straight up titled Strategy, Strategy, Strategy. But Deku's team focuses on defense, which makes sense in some ways, but maybe not in others. Like if he gets to keep his own point value, if nobody takes it from him, then defense is absolutely what you want to do. I think you want to back into a corner, barricade yourself, let your teammates just protect you and play no offense at all unless somebody comes and takes your, your thing around. Or maybe instead of barricading in a corner, you just want to stay on the move, doing laps on the outside or something. I think you're suddenly wanting to play keep away and defend if you get to keep those point values and then it makes sense. If you don't get to keep your own point values, then this makes no sense at all because defense has no value in this particular game unless you're just trying to keep somebody else in particular from winning. So it makes sense that they would focus on defense also from a superhero perspective, in my opinion, because that's what I think a superhero should focus on, at least in my fictional head canon of what I like out of superheroes. Also, a really clever revelation that happens is that I think it's members of class 1B, but they sandbagged the first competition. In truth, they could have finished higher than they did, but they intentionally stayed behind just to, to do well enough to move on to the next round, but not to move on with that high point value that would make them a target the way that Deku did. And I thought that was great. Hearing them talk about how they work together, they deserve to be rewarded. I think this is the kind of teamwork that UA should emphasize and should encourage. And I'm really impressed with the fact that 1B played the first competition the way they did. I don't think it's dirty pull at all. I admire it. 
In fact, I'm surprised there weren't more people doing that sort of thing. Also, if you can save your energy for the next competition, why not? I don't exactly know how much time elapses between the obstacle course and the cavalry battle, but at the very least, you want to avoid injuries in that first competition because there'd be nothing worse than finishing high but not being able to continue because of an injury. And in the cavalry battle, we see Deku and Todoroki go head to head for the first time. And I'm still so curious about Todoroki's backstory and his family dynamic. And they start to flirt with it a little bit in these episodes, in this stretch of episodes. And I can't wait to dive into it even more. But I'm becoming more and more intrigued with Todoroki. I'm starting to feel like this season, or at least this half season, is probably going to be dedicated to Todoroki and exploring who he is. I mean, of course, Deku is always going to be the main character. But Todoroki may get his side character focused during this stretch. It's certainly feeling that way to me curious about it. I love his dual nature, and we see for some reason he doesn't want to be like his father. His father is fire, so Todoroki emphasizes ice, and I'm loving it, and it's a little bit of an on-the-nose analogy, the fire and ice, but I don't care. I'm a guy who just likes the tension, and my curiosity is just sparked. And then a lesser character, this character Nato, I think is how you pronounce it. N-E-I-T-O is how it's spelled uh, when I saw it in the credits. But Nato, he has this really cool mimic ability where he can mimic the quirk or the powers of other people, other combatants that he's facing, which is a great skill to have unless you're facing off against a guy with no special abilities. Then suddenly you're a guy with no special abilities. I mean, if you're just going one-on-one -on -one with a regular guy who has a baseball bat, I don't know, can he steal the guy with the baseball bat quirk? That's not a quirk, that's just a guy with a baseball bat. Fortunately, in this world, so many people have quirks. It'll be rare that he would find himself in that situation, but I think it'd be cool if they found a way to put him there and see how he handles it. But this is a power I like, you know, I compared it to Rogue. It's a little bit different than Rogue because she actually steals the power. She doesn't just mimic it. And there's some other characters like Super Adaptoid. I've talked about some of the other Western comic book characters with that sort of mimic ability. I guess you could even throw Super Scroll kind of in there to a degree. But I like Nato. I hope he gets more involved in the sports festival. I want to see more about him. And I would love to see what he does if he has to, you know, go into combat with someone who has no quirk. What does he do in that situation? But something I alluded to before briefly, talking about Deku and his point value and his team strategy, is that you have to wonder if this sort of contest is even a good way to evaluate heroes. Like, I think this is more suited to a military type of thing. I mean, this is just kind of a high-level capture-the-flag type battle. And in my humble opinion, this would be a great way to evaluate uh, your military. Like, for example, if this was something that the Scout Regiment did as part of their training and attack on Titan, I think that kind of makes sense, or in the evaluation process there. Uh, but I just don't know how this works for heroes. I can see villains wanting to be good at stealing things and going offensive and being aggressive, but I really think Deku's team's approach of being defensive is really the better way to evaluate heroes, and maybe that is why this game is designed that way. Maybe the top point values get to keep their points if they're not taken away, so we evaluate how they defend, because they've already shown themselves to stand out in the previous operation so we want to see in this contest can they continue to stand out when everybody's gun in form even more than they would be just out of pure envy from their success and at the end i was really worried that deku was going to have another deus ex machina victory because at one point it looks like he steals back his own headband from todoroki but then we find out todoroki did just a little like presto changeo rearrangeo kind of thing where he actually didn't get the headband that was worth 10 million points he got one that's worth like 600 which you know it's good but it's nowhere near 10 million and then they have this great great climax or should i say anti-climax of the cavalry battle where you have our three principals todoroki bakugo deku all coming at each other like they're all just gonna hit and have this big dust up right at the buzzer and then in a hell mary buzzer beater kind of going for broke maneuver deku's gonna come up and win and we're gonna have this other kind of like mary sue type character gary stew if you prefer that phrase but anyway i was worried we were just gonna have too much of this guy wins everything but the buzzer goes off before they even make contact they all fall short and boy did I love how they subverted expectations there to show that, no, this is not going to be easy for anybody. No matter what you thought after that first one, the same trick is never going to work two contests in a row because we're dealing with high-level students here. 
I love it that they subverted expectations. I'm really glad it's not just going to be a walk in the park where Deku sweeps all the competition, though I know he will have some big triumphant moment at the end, and I'll be ready for that when it gets here. But I'm glad he lost. Now, I don't want him to go down the Ash Ketchum path of always losing, <laughs> but I'm glad that they finished up that cavalry battle the way they did. I found that to be a lot of fun. And then we do get a few focusing shots that feature a few scenes that feature Todoroki's father with the flame just coming all out of his face like a quirk that I guess he can't really turn off you know and boy does he seem like a formidable dude this guy is intimidating with that fire coming out of his face and he wants to talk to All Might who is also a formidable dude so I want to see how that goes down this guy really looks like somebody you don't want to mess with. I can't wait to see his role in the story. And I could absolutely start to see how this guy might have been too strict as a father, or at least in Todoroki's assessment, too strict, not caring enough, not loving enough that would make him sort of rebel against his father, not want to be like his father. I may be misreading the lay of the land here. We'll see as it unfolds. It might be something different. But I'm definitely intrigued and curious, which is a job's first story, is to keep the person consuming the story engaged. And I gotta say, boy, am I engaged. And as far as future reviews go, I'm gonna wait until after episode 12 of season two, because that's when the sports festival arc wraps up before I do my next review. And then I'm gonna go ahead and go by arc, because I found the wiki page, or the, I think it's called the My Hero Academia wiki, and it's got a breakdown that tells me how many episodes are in each arc, so now I can kind of plan better instead of just trying to guess as I watch it. I like to avoid spoilers, but it's a non-spoilery list that just gives the name of the arc and which episodes are involved. So I'm gonna wait till after episode 12 when the sports festival is over, then I'll, I think we have two more arcs in the back half of the season that I'll cover. And moving forward, I'm going to cover it arc by arc for reviews. Of course, I'll do the reactions, but it'll just help me move through it a little bit faster. You've probably noticed when I come up to review time, it takes me several days to really get my thoughts hammered out and rewatch the episodes and stuff. So if I do a little bit fewer reviews of bigger chunks, there'll be a little bit longer reviews, but I'll also move through the show a little bit more quickly because I got so much I want to do with this show, this property, these characters, but I've got to you know, build up my foundation a little bit by watching the available episodes first. And then I can go into some of the fun of discussing this the way I used to discuss comic book characters, only with My Hero Academia characters. Some of my character profiles like I did on Heroes and Villains. If you go back to my early videos on the channel, you'll see some of my comic book videos and how those were. And imagine doing those only with intellectual property for My Hero Academia and some other anime as I build up more of a foundation. But having said that, the last thing I want to say is that I'm proud of you for watching anime, and I'll talk to you again soon. I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who supports the channel on Patreon. It really means a lot to me. If you might be interested in Patreon perks like early access to videos, uncut reaction videos, ad-free videos, and the opportunity to vote on which anime will be covered in the future, then click on the link in the video description. Thank you.